an El Dorado for biologists. Barren rocks break the surface, the peaks of massive underwater mountains rising abruptly from the seabed. Anyone diving here descends into a virtually unexplored mountain world. Are these places really the paradise that dive operators claim? Underwater volcanoes are an interesting danger we don't usually think of for a number of reasons. They are underwater and silent. The power hiding below these giants is devastating and could mostly occur on a whim's notice. Scientists are always on the lookout for this underwater threat and they think they might have found one, getting into underwater volcanoes. You must understand how they operate in order to truly appreciate the awe and threat they pose to us. Underwater volcanoes are mostly found along the edges of Earth's tectonic plates, and these edges are of three main types. Imagine the Earth's crust like a giant jigsaw puzzle. At divergent boundaries, the puzzle pieces are moving apart. Here, as the plates separate, molten rock from deep inside the Earth rises up to fill the gap, cooling down to form new crust. Think of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, an underwater mountain range that's a whopping 10,000 miles long, rising up from the ocean floor. It's like a mega construction line constantly building new ocean floor, a bit like how our fingernails keep growing. Then there are convergent boundaries, where one plate dives below another. This is where things get really intense. The plate that gets pushed down starts melting due to the Earth's heat, and this creates magma. Because magma is lighter than the surrounding rocks, it rises up, leading to volcanic eruptions. A good example of this is the Mariana Arc in the Pacific Ocean, a collection of volcanic islands and deep-sea trenches. Now imagine two puzzle pieces sliding past each other. That's what happens at transform boundaries. Here, the friction and stress can sometimes melt the rocks below, causing volcanic activity. A famous example on land is California's San Andreas Fault, but this kind of boundary isn't really known for underwater volcanoes. Apart from these boundaries, there are also hot spots. These are like special spots deep inside the Earth where hot material rises to the surface, independent of the plate boundaries. The Hawaiian Islands are a perfect example. As the Pacific Plate moves over a hot spot, it forms a chain of islands. The youngest island is right over the hot spot, and as the plate moves, the islands get older and more worn down. It's like a conveyor belt of islands. Hotspots are fascinating because they come from deep within the Earth, maybe as deep as the boundary between the Earth's core and its mantle, way down at nearly 2,900 kilometers below the surface. Underwater volcanoes are like the hidden giants of the ocean world, coming in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some are small and humble, just like little hills under the sea, while others are massive, stretching out for hundreds of kilometers. They form when magma, the really hot molten rock from deep inside the Earth, makes its way up through the crust and spills out onto the ocean floor. These underwater outpourings are mostly made of basalt, a type of rock that's really runny when it melts, so it can flow and spread out to create all these different volcanic structures. Now think of the biggest thing you can imagine underwater. That's probably the mid-oceanic ridge. This thing is enormous. It's the longest mountain range in the world and it's all underwater. It stretches over 40,000 miles across the Earth's oceans. It's formed by tectonic plates, these massive slabs of Earth's crust moving apart. And as they do, magma rises up to fill the gap, creating this huge ridge. This isn't just a line of mountains. It's got a central valley, ridges, and all sorts of volcanic features like lava flows that look like pillows. Then there are seamounts and guyots, which are types of underwater mountains. Seamounts rise up from the ocean floor but don't break the surface of the water. Many of them are either active or sleeping volcanoes, and they're really important for ocean life. They're like underwater oases, bringing up nutrients and providing homes for lots of different sea creatures. Geos are a bit different. They used to be like seamounts, but they've been worn down flat by waves when they were above water. Then they sank down below the surface, so they've got these flat tops. Even though they're not as lively as seamounts, Geos still have their own unique ecosystems on their slopes. You know, tsunamis are these huge waves that can cause a lot of damage, and it's really interesting to learn that underwater volcanoes can actually create them. Let's think about how this happens. Imagine a volcano under the sea suddenly erupting. This eruption pushes the water above it, kind of like when you splash in the bathtub, but on a massive scale. 
and it's not just the eruption itself. Sometimes parts of the volcano might collapse like the caldera, which is a big crater. This can also move a lot of water all at once. Now these aren't your typical eruptions. When a volcano explodes underwater, it's like a very powerful release of magma and rocks. This can create a sudden and huge push on the water, leading to a tsunami. It's not only eruptions though. Even landslides or big chunks of the volcano falling into the sea can do this. Also, when there's a volcanic eruption under the sea, it can send out what we call pyroclastic flows. These are really hot, fast-moving clouds of gas and volcanic material. When they hit the water, they also push it and can create a tsunami. So it's all about a big movement of water. Whether it's from the eruption, a collapse or a landslide, it's this sudden shift that starts the tsunami. It's quite a process and shows just how powerful and connected everything under the sea is. It's not just about the drama of an eruption. It's about understanding these immense forces and how they can impact us, especially for people living near coasts. That's why scientists keep an eye on underwater volcanoes and try to understand them better. Talking about tsunamis, there have been some really huge ones in history caused by volcanic activity. Like back in 1883, the Krakatoa volcano erupted so violently that it caused its own caldera to collapse. This event created massive tsunamis that led to more than 36,000 deaths. It's just mind-blowing to think about the power of nature sometimes. Then there's the ancient eruption of Santorini, around 1600 BCE. This one's pretty famous because it's thought to have caused big tsunamis that affected civilizations around the Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. It's amazing how these events from so long ago still capture our attention. More recently, in 2018, there was the eruption of Anak Krakatau. This one caused a landslide and, you guessed it, another tsunami. It led to hundreds of deaths and was a stark reminder of how volcanic activity can still have such devastating effects. But here's a surprising fact about tsunamis. They can travel really, really far. Like in 2004, there was this massive tsunami in the Indian Ocean. It was actually caused by an undersea earthquake, not a volcano. But the waves traveled thousands of kilometers and hit coasts far away from where the earthquake happened. Tsunamis are truly global phenomena. Their effects can be felt across oceans, sometimes hours or even days after they start. To deal with this, scientists have come up with some clever ways to give us a heads up about tsunamis. They've placed sensors on the ocean floor that can detect pressure changes, and these are connected to buoys on the surface. There are also tidal gauges along coastlines that keep an eye on sea levels. And of course, monitoring earthquakes is super important, as they're the most common cause of tsunamis. But all the technology in the world isn't enough if people don't know what to do. That's why having good disaster response plans and making sure everyone knows about tsunami risks and what to do if one is coming is super important. It's all about staying informed and prepared. Nature is awe-inspiring, but it pays to remember that it can be incredibly powerful and sometimes dangerous. Keeping an eye on underwater volcanoes is quite the task. It's a bit like being a detective, but for the ocean floor. Scientists use all sorts of cool gadgets and methods to figure out what's happening down there. One of the main tools they use is sonar mapping, which is like echolocation. They send sound waves down to the ocean floor, and these waves bounce back up giving them a picture of what's down there, including any volcanic structures or changes because of volcanic activity. Then there are underwater seismographs. These are like the earthquake detectors you might have heard about, but they're for under the sea. They pick up any shaking or rumbling from the earth, which can often be a sign that a volcano is getting ready to erupt. Satellites help out too. They're not just for spying on other countries or checking the weather, they can actually see changes on the ocean's surface from space, which can indicate an underwater volcano is active. They can also detect heat and different gases coming from these eruptions. Another neat trick is checking the ocean's water chemistry. If there's a change in things like the water's acidity or temperature, it might mean a volcano is stirring. And there's something called hydroacoustic sensors. These pick up low-frequency sounds from underwater eruptions and seismic activity, kind of like a super-sensitive ear underwater. But here's the thing. Predicting when these underwater volcanoes will erupt is really tough. They're not as easy to get to as volcanoes on land, and the deep sea is a pretty harsh place, so the equipment doesn't always last long. Plus, the whole field of predicting underwater eruptions is still pretty new. There's a lot we don't know yet because we just haven't had enough experience with them. A couple of famous underwater volcanoes are Loihi Seamount near Hawaii and Surtsey off the coast of Iceland. 
Lowy is still underwater, but it's active and might eventually become a new island. Surtsey actually did pop up above the water in the 1960s and became a new island. And scientists are super interested in how new life forms start living on new land like that. It's a bit like watching a barren island turn into a nature reserve from scratch. Plus, Surtsey is protected for scientific research, so it's like a natural laboratory for studying how ecosystems start and grow. Thank you.